Hello to all of you listening. I hope and pray that this finds you fit and in good spirits. You join me today as we continue on with our journey through Mark's Gospel. Last time we concluded chapter number 13, so today we will begin chapter 14. And our reading is the first nine verses. So this is Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 9. After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves, and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. This is the word of the Lord. Before we consider today's passage of scripture, Let's briefly review what we looked at last time. As I'm sure you remember, we finished chapter number 13. All of the things that we read in this chapter took place on the Tuesday of Passion Week. Mark devotes the whole of this chapter to Jesus' discussion with the disciples Peter, James, John and Andrew. They had come to him privately, following his pronouncement regarding the destruction of the temple. They wanted to know when this would take place, and what signs they should look out for. We call the speech that Jesus gave in answering their queries the Olivet Discourse. The discourse ends with Jesus warning against time or date setting regarding when these end time events will take place. He does this by announcing that the exact date for his return is known only by God the Father. Neither the angels in heaven or the Lord Jesus at this particular time knew when the second coming would occur. The fact that Jesus didn't know the time of his return has been the cause of much debate over the centuries. If Jesus was God and God is omniscient or all-knowing, how could he not know this information? We accept the biblical truth that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. The theological term for the coming together of the two natures of Christ is called the hypostatic union. Jesus Christ was the only person that ever lived who had two natures merged into one person. But as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, as part of the incarnation or taking on of human flesh, Jesus emptied himself. He lived, if you like, under the limitations of being a human man. Jesus, of course, retained all the attributes of divinity, yet, as a man, he voluntarily restricted their use. Scripture reveals that Jesus faithfully obeyed the Father's will, and on this occasion God the Father did not will him to have this particular knowledge of his second coming. Therefore, at this point in his ministry, he could honestly say that he did not know the day or hour of his return. This does not diminish the deity of Jesus, but simply affirms his full humanity. The main point with all of this is that it is utterly foolish for human beings to try and make accurate predictions. Sadly, this has not deterred many over the years, and still today, from setting dates. Last week we ran through a list of people who have all wrongly predicted the return of our Lord and Saviour. I repeat the warning that I gave to you then. Ignore such people for the false teachers that they are. However, this is not an invitation to never think about these things or to bury our heads in the sand. We are called upon to carefully look at and consider what is happening around the world. 
Are the events that are happening today in Israel significant? Is the dramatic rise in Jews coming to Christ and returning to their ancestral homeland worth noting? Yes, absolutely. It is a sign that the end may be close. Assume that it is and you will never be caught off guard. Jesus closes the Olivet Discourse with a parable. The parable is intended to remind his hearers of the importance of staying vigilant and ready. The parable concerns a wealthy man and his household. The man has to travel to a far-off country. Therefore he leaves his servants and the doorkeeper in charge whilst he is away. The servants are given work to do and the doorkeeper is commanded to keep watch. The reason for this vigilance is that they do not know when their master will return. He would be most displeased to return and find them sleeping or not doing the work that they were assigned. The man in the parable is, of course, the Lord Jesus. The house represents the church. The servants of the doorkeeper are those tasked with looking after and caring for Christ's church. At this present time, our master, the Lord Jesus, is away. He is in heaven, seated at the right-hand side of the Father. But soon, and we cannot say when, he will return. When he does, we don't want him to find us sleeping or being lazy, or not doing the work with which we have been called to do. Therefore, the call for us is to watch, to be ready for our Saviour's return. Today we will begin chapter number 14. The Tuesday of Passion Week was certainly an event-filled day. Mark, as we have seen, devotes a lengthy portion of his gospel to the events that took place on this Tuesday. Finally it's over and Wednesday begins. Traditionally this day was referred to as Spy Wednesday. This reflects the fact that it was on this particular day that Judas Iscariot conspired against the Lord Jesus. Compared to Tuesday, the Wednesday of Passion Week is very quiet. None of the Synoptic Gospel writers devote much time to it. We are left, therefore, wondering exactly how Jesus spent this day. Given how little time remained to him, we might have imagined that he'd have been very busy. But it appears as if he spent most of the day quietly, in the company of the disciples. Did Jesus spend the day teaching and preparing them for what was to come? Did they enjoy a day walking in the hills? Or did they spend most of the day relaxing in Bethany? God's word does not say, so we must be content with what is given to us. But let's look then at what occurred on the Wednesday of Passion Week. Verses 1 and 2. After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. I have to confess that until recently I had always misread this verse. I read it to mean that Mark was picking up the action two days after the events of Tuesday. This is, of course, not what is being conveyed here. Matthew states it much more clearly. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all those sayings, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Matthew 26, verses 1 and 2. So the Olivet Discourse, all these sayings, as we know, took place on the Tuesday. The Feast of Passover took place two days later, on Thursday. So as I explained in my introduction, the things that we are reading about here took place on the Wednesday of Jesus' Passion Week. It occurred to me as I was preparing this that I have frequently referred to the final week of the Lord Jesus' earthly ministry as the Passion Week. I'm sure that you all know to what this title refers, but you may be unaware of why we use the term Passion. Today we use the word Passion to express a strong emotion or conviction, or an intense feeling. We might describe, for example, someone who loves sport as having a passion for sport. You might have a passion for watching TV dramas, knitting, learning a foreign language, or hopefully reading your Bible. But the passion used to describe Jesus last week on earth comes from the Greek verb pashko, 
meaning to experience a sensation or impression, usually painful, or to feel or to suffer or to be vexed. So when we speak of Jesus' passion, we mean the suffering and anguish that he experienced or endured on our behalf. Anyway, after that mini detour, let's get back to our account. Let me say a few things here about the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. The Jews began to celebrate Passover on the 14th of the month Nisan. This takes place in March or April on our calendar. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread followed on the 15th through to the 21st of Nisan. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a one-week celebration. What exactly was the Passover? Well, Passover commemorated the Israelites' redemption from slavery in Egypt at the time of the Exodus. The Jews remembered how on this particular day the angel of death passed over the homes of the Israelites who had placed the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. They remembered on this yearly celebration how God in his loving mercy had spared them. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread was a memorial to remember the haste in which the Israelites left Egypt. God told them to be ready to leave and hence there was no time to bake bread with leaven or yeast included. It's important for us to note that the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover were considered as one and the names were often used interchangeably. It was a major celebration and every possible preparation was made for the event. For a month before the event began, the meaning of Passover was explained in each synagogue and Jewish school so that no one, young or old, was unprepared. Passover was also a pilgrim feast which meant the Jews were expected to travel to Jerusalem in order to celebrate together. This was in fact a requirement of the Mosaic law. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 16. It meant, as you can imagine, that Jerusalem became insanely overcrowded. One writer claimed that the population of Jerusalem swelled from its normal population of around 50,000 to more than 250,000 at Passover time. So it's against this backdrop that we read about the wicked schemes of the scribes and the Pharisees. They had sought without success to try and trap him in his words. We saw how they made repeated efforts to do so. We should note here that they did not merely seek to arrest and imprison this innocent man. Rather, they want to kill him and put him permanently out of the way. However, this has to be done with extreme caution. With a city full of Passover pilgrims, many of whom held Jesus in high regard, they feared a potential riot. It was certainly the case that the city was a tense and potentially volatile place during these mass gatherings. The Jewish pilgrims were zealous for freedom from their Roman oppressors, so it would not take very much to get them riled up. Therefore, the Jewish leaders did not want to make a move against Jesus in public during the Passover. It would be better, they determined, to wait until the crowds had gone. Their plans, however, were thwarted. Jesus was arrested and killed during the Passover celebrations. This just goes to show how Jesus always remained in complete control of the situation. Well, let us continue. Verse number three. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Before looking at this event in more detail, I have to point out that there is considerable debate surrounding when this actual event took place. John, in his Gospel, records this incident taking place prior to the triumphal entry. You can read about this in John chapter 12. Many scholars therefore think that Mark has deliberately inserted this account here out of chronological sequence. And he has done this in order to encourage us to draw a contrast between the woman in the story and her act of loving devotion and Judas Iscariot and his selfish act of bitter betrayal. Whatever position we take as regards when exactly this took place, it does not fundamentally impact our understanding of what exactly happened. So let's consider what we are told. These events took place in the small town of Bethany, located on the lower eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives, about two miles east of Jerusalem. 
This, remember, was where Jesus based himself during the final period of his earthly ministry. In particular, the events that we are reading about took place in the house of Simon the leper. In reality, he was Simon the former leper. Lepers, you see, were not permitted to host dinner parties. Was it the Lord Jesus who had healed Simon of his leprosy? It's certainly a strong possibility. So Jesus is sat, or more probably reclining at the table, when he is approached by an unnamed woman. We know, however, from John's account, that it was Mary, sister of Martha and Lazarus. She is carrying an alabaster flask of spikenard oil. The alabaster flask, made of soft marble-like stone imported from Egypt, was a precious and valuable object. It may also have been an important family heirloom. What you may ask is spikenard oil. Well, it's a kind of sweet-smelling oil or nard, perfume, that is derived from the roots of a rare, rare plant that's only found in India. Mary then broke the flask and poured its contents over Jesus' head. Why, you might wonder, did Mary break the flask? Was such an act necessary? Presumably the oil could be poured out from the neck, in the same way that it had been put inside the flask. We are left here then to speculate a little. Is it possible that the flask was designed in such a way that it had to be broken in order to access the contents? This would mean, of course, that the contents had to be used in one single application. John tells us that the flask contained a pound of ointment, John 12, verse 3. The word pound here is a translation of the Greek litra. A Roman pound or litra was equivalent to 329 grams, which means that the volume of perfume Mary had in the flask was equivalent to, say, a can of Coca-Cola today. Or... Did she break the flask in order that it might never be used again? After the holy task of anointing the Messiah, how could the flask ever really be used again? Or is it an indication of what Mary was willing to give up for the Lord Jesus? That she would hold nothing back, not only the costly perfume, but also the flask in which the perfume resided? Why did Mary pour her oil over Jesus' head? It's not something we'd do if we were invited to a dinner party today. But in Jesus' day, anointing a guest's head was a common way to honour a person at a festive occasion. In fact, when a guest arrived for a meal, it was customary to anoint the guest's head with a dab of oil. But here, something far more is going on. Mary is expressing her love to Jesus because he was going to the cross to die for her. She is preparing his body for burial, as she anointed his head and his feet. This was an act of her great love for Jesus, while he was still alive. Well, let's read on. Verses 4 and 5. But there were some who were indignant among themselves, and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred denarii, and given to the poor. And they criticised her sharply. Mary's extravagant and loving gesture is not appreciated by all those present. There were some who were indignant or greatly displeased by this act. Mark does not mention who it was, but John does. Here's what his account tells us. But one of the, his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. This John chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. Judas's complaint derived from his perceived waste of this valuable commodity. He estimates its value at more than 300 denarii. As I explained before, a denarius was a day's wage for the common labourer in Jesus' day. So in effect... This flask and its contents were almost the equivalent to a year's salary. Can you imagine spending a year's salary in one time? It was a waste, he proclaimed, because it could have been used to help the poor and do much good in alleviating poverty. Apparently on Passover Eve, it was customary to give a special offering for the poor. We know, of course, that Judas was a liar and a thief. He had no great love or concern for the poor. He was simply just a greedy man. 
As the disciple charged with looking after the money, he saw it as an opportunity to fill his own pockets. Judas may have been the one who started the complaint, but others, it seemed, joined him. Mark points out that they criticised Mary sharply. The words used here in English are a little weak. What is being conveyed here is that they snorted with anger. Picture an enraged bull flaring its nostrils, and you get a better sense of the way these men reacted to Mary's act of loving devotion. The disciples, you see, could see no reason for this waste, because they did not understand that Jesus' death was imminent. Well, let's see how Jesus responds to their sharp criticism of Mary. Verse 6. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. The Lord Jesus here defends Mary's act. They are not to criticise or trouble her for her great act of love and devotion. In fact, they should have commended her rather than criticising her. What she did was a good and beautiful thing. Let us continue. Verses 7 and 8. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. We should be careful here not to misunderstand the Lord's words. He is neither minimising the suffering or the plight of the poor, or telling us that we should not care for them. The poor had a special place in Jewish obligations, as is stressed in Deuteronomy chapter 15. The outcasts and the marginalised also had a special place in the heart of our Lord and Saviour. So Jesus fully recognises the importance of ministry to the poor. When we devote our time or our resources to helping, we are doing a very good thing. The point that Jesus is making here is that we are not limited in the opportunities that we will have to assist the poor. You can read the following statement, which is included in the United Nations Sustainable Development Plan. Here's what they state as their goal when it comes to poverty. Eradicating extreme poverty for all people everywhere by 2030 is a pivotal goal of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. A worthy aim, perhaps, but we all know that such a goal is pie in the sky. It's simply unachievable. Sadly, you see, we will always have the poor. Even in developed nations like the United States, South Korea and the United Kingdom, there are, will always be people living in poverty. Therefore, whatever we are, we will never be short of opportunities to help those in need. But Jesus, by contrast, was only present on earth for a very short time. Those living in the first century had just a few short years in which to exist or in interact with the God-man. Perhaps they didn't realise it at the time, despite the fact that Jesus had told them what would happen. So Mary had taken her once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to minister to her Messiah and to prepare for his death. Perfume, as we know, was often used as a burial spice. We know that it was used by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus at Jesus' burial. So the Lord Jesus interprets her deed here as a prophetic act, pointing forward to his burial. Let us conclude our study by looking at verse number 9. Verse number 9. Assuredly, I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. This incident comes to a close with the Lord Jesus making two promises. The first promise deals with the eventual spread and proclamation of the gospel. Jesus doesn't limit the spread to Israel, the neighbouring nations, or even to the Roman Empire. He tells his listeners that this gospel, the good news, will be preached in the whole world. This, of course, indicates that when he departs, he will be gone for some time. In modern times, the gospel message can be shared and spread quickly. The internet allows us to reach many people quite easily. But in the past, the gospel had to be carried and shared by word of mouth. The second promise concerns how Mary's act will be remembered forever. This is because what she did is recorded for us in God's revelation. The disciples, as we have seen, longed for recognition 
fame and positions of power in Christ's kingdom. But this did not interest Mary. She found an enduring memorial, not by longing for the position of honour, but simply by loving Jesus and serving him. We would do well to remember that the deeds and words of men are remembered only as long as they exist in the mind and can be conveyed to others. We all know that when we die, the things that we said or did during our lifetimes will largely be forgotten. It may of course be true that the deeds of men may be recorded in books or today storage on digital forms of media, but even these things only have a limited shelf life. Books eventually crumble into dust, compact discs or digital storage files become corrupted and can no longer be accessed. But God's word has eternal permanence. As we are told by the prophet Isaiah, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40 verse 8. So whenever and wherever the Gospels are read or preached, what Mary did when she anointed our Lord and Saviour will be remembered and celebrated. And the Lord's words are, of course, today fulfilled in this very room, or as you listen to my words. Today we, removed by close to 2,000 years, are touched and moved by what Mary did. Next week, we will, Lord willing, we will look at Judas's betrayal of the Lord, and Jesus celebrating the Passover with his disciples. Things to think about. I have two comments to make on today's passage of Scripture. Number one, don't lose sight of what's really important. Have you ever heard the term, the social gospel? You might think that this is a relatively new movement, but in fact you'd be wrong. The social gospel movement can trace its roots all the way back to the late 1800s, Promoters of the social gospel back then, and still today, seek to apply Christian principles to social problems. They are concerned with things like equal rights reforms, alleviating poverty, promoting good nutrition and good health, education, and helping people with alcohol or drug addictions. Now these things are all important. They are things that as Christians we ought to be concerned about. But the great danger of the social gospel is that as these social needs were emphasised, the doctrines of sin, salvation, heaven and hell, and the future kingdom of God were often downplayed. Or, to put it more simply, the priorities often became confused. You see, people's real need is to hear the gospel message. So give them the good news first, and then help them in other ways. We saw this played out in today's account. We know that Judas was not being genuine, but he, along with the other disciples, claimed that they wanted to help the poor. But Mary, on the other hand, knew that it was right and proper to first worship the Lord. What about us? Where do our priorities lie? Are we putting other things before what's really important? So let us seek the Holy Spirit's wisdom and guidance so that we don't ever lose sight of what's really important. Number two, don't be put off by the criticism of others. Mary, in today's account, was sharply criticised by some of the disciples. They viewed what she did to be a waste. They questioned her judgment in doing such a thing. Surely the better option would have been to use those resources to help the poor. What she did, however, was the right thing, and she earned the defence and praise of the Lord Jesus. I wonder if at times we too face the harsh criticism of others. Do others look at what we are doing and criticise us sharply? Do people look at us and think that we might be making the wrong choices? Perhaps your family disagree with your Christian faith. Perhaps they think that you are caught up in a cult. Perhaps you are criticised for not taking part in the chaser each holiday season. Maybe you are criticised for your involvement in the church. Perhaps your spouse or other family members think that you do too much, that you are too involved in church things. Perhaps your friends criticise you for not being the great drinking buddy you used to be, for refusing to go on trips on a Sunday because you have to attend church. These are just some examples, and I'm sure you can think of many others. It's hard and often discouraging when we face the criticism of others. 
but we should take comfort and strength from the example of Mary. She did what she knew to be right, even though it made those watching angry and indignant. May we too continue to do what is right, as we attempt to live good and pleasing lives before God. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. In the evening he came with the twelve, now, as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, Is it I? Is it I? It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Assuredly, I say to you that today, 
even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping. Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal. Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him. Rabbi, Rabbi. And kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. <laughs> then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber? with swords and clubs to take me. I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Now, a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, 
Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him. Prophesy! And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again, and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time, the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. <laughs> and when he thought about it, he wept. <laughs>